If you take the Arrow Dream as creating a, a significantly deep system, then you needed to connect the caves up at Top Camp C3 and C4 with the main river that we found so far, which is the 27 Streamway. It, um, so you, you have the difficult thing of, uh, if you put that in the Yorkshire Dales, you'd think it was nothing. Um, the things that perhaps make it difficult or psychologically more challenging um, are the sense of it being a bit further away from home. Now, water isn't breathable at 600 metres any more than it is at the surface. Um, perhaps it's a little bit colder. From my point of view, the long journey to the sump means there's more chance that the equipment is going to go wrong when you get there, hence the very long time preparing it. You've had to take it to pieces. And although it's quite a kindly environment, it's by no means the perfect place to uh, put together relatively fine tolerance machinery. So you have a sense of it. You know, I don't know what's happened to it exactly. People have been gentle, but it's got a bit battered. It's got a bit dirty. Can I put it together so it's not going to cause any unpleasant surprises when I'm underwater? So that's a challenge that you wouldn't get if you rolled out of the back of the car and went straight into a sump pool. I wasn't necessarily using the kit that I would use to dive that somewhere else because it's a relatively unknown thing. We've got a certain length and depth. So I was choosing to use um, a rebreather, which is fine, but there's a little bit more intensity of emotion about is it going to work, is it going to... When rebreathers fail, they do it in quite an exciting way. Um, but you choose to use that because it's a lot less for the team to carry uh, and it gives you more chance to go backwards and forwards. You will have a, a cylinder of oxygen enriched gas uh, and this will feed into a valve in the rebreather. Uh, and the rebreather consists of the valve which will give you the, I call it nitrox, the rich, enriched uh, air. When you breathe in, the valve will give you that, goes into you. When you breathe out, the air first goes into the scrubber that takes out the CO2. When you breathe in, if you've not, if you've not breathed out through your nose, if you just breathe in through your mouth, then you're breathing the same gas with the CO2 taken out of it. Each time you breathe in and out through the mouth, the oxygen content is going down a little bit. When you breathe out through your nose, then that gas is lost to the system and there is no gas in you or in the rebreather. But when you breathe in again, then the valve here takes the gas out of the cylinder, the rebreather fills up, and then when you breathe in through your mouth, then you've got another lungful. So if you just keep breathing in and out through your mouth four times and that gas is just being used, oxygen is going down. At the end of four breaths, you exhale through your nose, it goes into the sump. And then it's when you breathe in through your mouth next that you get a fresh batch of oxygen and rich gas to breathe. OK, so I was very lucky uh, to be following on from the work that my friend Paul McQuill had done over the previous years. So I knew that he'd uh, found the way on from the great big sump pool uh, and, and had uh, reached an arch at about 30 metres depth and was starting to go uphill. Uh, so I'd taken uh, a reel of line with me which would allow me to lay it out and follow it back if the visibility was less good. However, um, Paul's line was intact, I followed that down um, and just found his line reel lying as he left it a year ago um, and picked it up so that it was fit for use and literally then I just had the line reel in my hand and had to decide where to go. A nice thing about this sump is that it was pretty straightforward. We had a nice uh, sandy floor with ripples on it, like on a beach. Uh, and the best way to follow the flow, which I decided was obviously the best thing to do in terms of just going downstream, was to identify the ripples, identify which way indicated downstream flow and just follow that. So it's pretty much real. Um, then use a big plastic tube, which you put into the sand and you can tie the line off to that. So that means that the line stays where you expect it to be rather than perhaps get moved to one side or another. So first be laying, start reeling up uh, the sand slope and probably four or five minutes of that stopping to be lay the line to keep it safe for the journey back. Uh, saw me on the other side of the sump. Uh, entire dive was 11 minutes. I looked at that because I, I knew it had been short and you need to think about the time in terms of your decompression and in terms of um, 
how long it would take if you had to dive back, not on the rebreather, which is always a consideration. Uh, but yeah, 11 minutes. Uh, it was it was quite steep um, because you think it probably it rose 25 meters vertically over a distance of what 45. So if you look at the angle, it is quite steep. You feel that on the way up, you just kind of wait, thinking, "Good grief, there must be a surface somewhere." Because I'm looking at the computer, going, you know, 20, 18, 15. And you go, is it going to actually break surface, which is what you expect? Is in fact just going to go to about eight and then just sit there for the next half mile, which would be a bit of a down, the boat was always possible. Um, and the only thing you have to do there is you need to control the breathing because the rebreather copes least well with chains of depth. So if you sit at one depth, whatever it is, uh, then it's very gas efficient. The downside of this up is that it's all depth change. So you do breathe, you use a bit more gas than you'd normally do. So again, the most technical thing about it is fully managing the rebreather on this particular dive. So I knew it was a big sump pool because the, there's that wonderful thing we've got good visibility and a bright light is that you see the shimmer of the sump pool from underneath and you can see it's a big one because you're going, yeah, this is going to be good. Although, of course, because what you're getting is reflection, you don't know whether what you're going to emerge into is uh, the large, beautiful passage, which it was, or in fact, an air bell, which is about eight inches high. And it's only when you pop surface and your head doesn't go, dump, you go, yeah, this is good. But otherwise, no, because we didn't know for sure whether we were going to get into 2.7. Um, you'd expect so, but I've been full like that before around here. You just do something you can't, don't expect at all. In this case, it's actually the surveys were good and the cave was where you wanted it to be. So I, I didn't know at all. I recognised the sort of cave it is because caves do have a certain character. And I thought this feels like 2.7, but I didn't know that people had been there. Uh, got out of the water uh, and was actually thinking, because I couldn't see an obvious mark at that point, uh, I actually carried my dive kit a fair way down the passage, thinking well, maybe this is just a short section of cave and there's going to be another sump, and then I'll surface and there might be an obvious marker. After the first couple hundred metres, I thought, oh, blow it, I can't be bothered carrying this, and I might break it. I took the kit off. And it's when I went a bit further that I was looking carefully at some of the higher sandbanks and saw the boot prints. Um, and the boot prints that we all used 20 years back were quite distinctive. And so I saw that and thought, OK, great, this must be 2.7 because those are OUCC welly boots, <laughs> sad to say. Uh, so I was then content with where we were. And that meant that when I went back and looked more carefully around the sump pool, um, I realised there was a cairn of about three rocks so high and then saw the scrap of paper underneath it. And that had the survey station notes from uh, the year 2000. And that properly confirmed it so that it wasn't just a question of, I recognize the blueprints, but this is documentary evidence that we've got. That was lovely. That was very um, comforting almost because uh, one of the, the key points when a dive can go wrong is actually when you're getting ready to go back into the water because, okay, it's got you there okay. But since then, you've messed with it. You've taken it all off. You've taken it to pieces. You've maybe knocked it against some rocks, as I've done in this case. Uh, so you do have that moment just before you put everything back on and breathe it, where you're going, I hope it works all right. Otherwise, I'll, I'll probably manage, but it will be a bit more stressful than I would like. Um, and in this case, it's just at that very moment, having the piece of paper and the initials on it with two friends of mine, it suddenly felt just that bit less isolated. And that was marvellous. It suddenly felt like... Um, there weren't friends who could help you, but there were friends there. And that was, that was one of the actually best feelings of all.